All right. Um, it's 8 p.m. 01, uh, my time. I'm based in London, and we'll slowly get started. Um, just a few, um, a few logistics. Uh, I'm not going to be able to see the chat in the presenter's notes, so please save your questions until the end of the talk. Uh, we'll have a few minutes to go through them. There's also this uh, Q&A uh, bar. I don't know if you can see that, but you could also post your questions there, and uh, we should have some time to go through them um, in the end of the talk. And uh, let's kick in. And yeah, if folks could mute themselves during the talk would also be super helpful. Um, all right, welcome to our uh, deep learning talk. Um, before we uh, dive in, maybe just a few words about me. Um, my name is Uliana. I currently work as a machine learning analyst at Stripe based in London. We work with operations data and we're trying to make support experience for Stripe better for our users. And before joining Stripe, um, I spent way too much time at school. Uh, did my undergrad and master's in economics and I was a PhD researcher at uh, Columbia University before transitioning to tech. So um, our main goal today is to gain foundational understanding and intuition of what neural networks are, how the model is adapted, what are the main decisions that a researcher has to make when designing the model. So we'll spend some time working through the simplest model, which is a single layer perceptron setup. And we'll also see how it extends to deep neural networks and we'll walk through the training algorithms. Then we'll touch base a little bit on more advanced architectures and uh, we'll have about like five to 10 minutes for a q and I'm gonna take a quick look at the chat to make sure that you guys can hear me, uh, but it seems like you can, so that's great. Um, Okay, just one second. The sharing isn't working that well. All right, um, let's begin. Um, neural networks. Neural networks are statistical models that generate the right features by combining the predictive variables and subsequently model the dependent variable as a function of these derived features. So the term neural network encompasses a wide variety of models, uh, initially inspired by their emulation of human brain. I'm not in the position to talk about the human brain, but uh, that's what the history says. Um, and the ultimate aim of all neural networks is basically to approximate the relationship within the data um, by approximating a parent variance function and learning the optimal parameter values to achieve the best function approximation. So find the function, find the parameters that optimize the function. Um, modern advanced tools like um, DALI, for example, or Google's BART, as well as large language models that I'm sure you're all familiar with, are also deep learning models. And they share the foundation, foundational principles with simpler models, such as single layer networks uh, or a single layer perceptron that we're gonna go through um, in a bit. So this is the single layer perceptron. Um, and this is the most foundational model. Single layer perceptron feed forward neural network with just one hidden layer. This model uh, can be used for both classification and integration. So the, your output layer will be different depending on what type of problem you're solving. So for classification, the last layer, a layer uh, on the slide you can see here. Um, so for classification, this layer will have k outputs dependent there on the number of classes. And for regression, that's the value of y that we are trying to predict. So notation on this slide is a little bit abused just for simplification. Basically, X are the input variables, features, or predictors. We also sometimes call them explanatory variables. Um, the derived features Z are generated uh, using linear combinations of predictors, and uh, we call them hidden hidden units because uh, they're not. So then the output variable Y is modeled as a function of linear combinations of the derived features uh, of the derived hidden units Z. And um, this is also this network is also called fully connected network, uh, which means that each neuron or unit is connected uh, with each unit in the following layer. So it's also called feed forward network. A lot of buzzwords, but um, it all it's all going to make sense in um, feed forward network because the data basically flows in one direction from input to the output without any feedback loops or any like recurrent connections. 
um, and can, uh, connecting line here uh, basically indicate indicate mathematical operations that are applied on the inputs to produce the outputs. Um, so a bit of math here. Now let's look at it. Uh, our input variables are vector valued features x. Um, those features pass through a nonlinear transformation to produce unit units that. And the nonlinearity here is uh, the key. It allows us to capture uh, intricate inter interdependencies in the data. So then um, the output layer of the, uh, the output of the hidden layer, we pass it uh, as a linear combination into the output layer. So depending on the problem that you're solving, we can either apply an identity function to produce y, or we can apply a softmax function to produce the probabilities uh, for the uh, classification model. So you're going to already see this nested structure of the model where inputs are passed as a linear combination uh, through a nonlinear function, then to be passed through another term trace function to produce the output. So you can imagine that the more hidden layers we have, uh, this nested structure will be kind of reproduced or repeated. So in a nutshell, neural networks are composed of layers of linear transformations or the weighted sums that are followed by nonlinear activation functions. And without those, those linearities, you can see from the formulas in the slide that the entire network will basically collapse into a single linear function, uh, which will not be able to make all those interesting predictions and will not be able to capture complex dependencies in the data. Um, so this nonlinear activation function uh, here in the slide is called the sigmoid function. And the choice is not random. The uh, first sigmoid function is nonlinear, and that's what we want in the neural network. So it will help us with modeling more complex relationships. But it also has a smooth, continuous um, derivative, which will help in optimization uh, that we're going to talk about later in a few slides. Um, the, the history says that the early usage of the sigmoid function was inspired by the behavior of biological neurons that kind of exhibit this behavior that stimulus is being accumulated and then the neuron fires up to produce a signal, but uh, we don't know if, if that's actually true or not, or maybe this function was just chosen for, its proper, for the properties of its derivative. So in math terms, the sigmoid function has this uh, desirable property of saturating with extreme input values. Um, which will help with uh, modeling complex relationships in the data. Um, but it has some limitations. We'll discuss them later on. So in modern applications, sigmoid function uh, is, is not that widely used, and uh, people generally use rectified linear units. We'll discuss why. Um, so yeah, the algebraic representation of the single uh, layer perceptron is quite simple. Uh, we can see that a linear combination of inputs is the path through a nonlinear activation function. So you take the inputs, you compute their linear combination, pad them through a nonlinear activation function, compute combination of that to produce a result. And what we're doing in practice, how the model is actually being trained, we're trying to estimate a set of the parameters here, they are for simplicity called alpha and beta. So the set of the parameters that will minimize some loss or error function that we're going to define, which is typically either the sum of squares for regression or cross entropy for classification. So this unknown parameters are called weights and that's the whole point of optimizing the model to find those parameters. Um, the generic approach to uh, minimizing this error or cost function um, uh, method to do that is called gradient descent. And in our setting, in neural network setting, it's called back propagation. Uh, we'll talk about that as well in a few slides. Um, uh, one thing to point here is that um, the single error perceptron are over parameterized, so they will likely overfit the data which means that they will perform really well on the training data and not so well on the test data. And there is a number of techniques, they are called regularization techniques, um, that will help with the problem of repeating and we'll, we'll talk about that as well. Um, so now moving on to a uh, multiple layer perceptron. Uh, deep forward networks uh, are natural generalization of single layer perceptrons and they allow for multiple hidden units, uh, hidden layers that you can see on the slide. There's two here. Um, they are pretty much quintessential deep learning model, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, the question is why do we need so many layers or why do we need multiple hidden layers? 
And the answer is that uh, this architecture, again, non-linearity, non it allows us to approximate uh, functions that uh, will generalize well, so they will predict really well out of sample. So the network becomes deep when we add more layers. And here in the slide, you can see how this nested structure of the output function is present and becomes more complex. So we basically recurse in the idea of a single layer perceptron. So um, multiple layers unlock a number of, number of good things for us. First is hierarchical feature learning, which means that different layers in their deep neural network can learn hierarchical representations of the input data. So each, each layer will capture increasingly abstract and more complex features from the raw input. And if we only have one layer, obviously we can do that. So for example, for image recognition, initial layers will detect simple features like edges, corners of the images, but with deeper layers, um, uh, deeper layers we may be able to identify more uh, complex shapes, textures, etc. cetera. Um, the next thing is feature abstraction. So uh, deep networks can automatically detect relevant features from the data, and then they reduce the need for uh, handcrafting or like feature engineering. So this is very different from traditional machine learning where we first have to do that. We first have to do feature engineering, for example, things like dimensionality reduction, PCA, et cetera. But in a deep learning model, in deep learning, the model will search for those transformations itself. So it will look for the best set of features to make the predictions. Uh, so this is very good in the context of like high dimensional or unstructured data, for example, like images or audio or text. Um, then two other things, improved representational power, which means that uh, deep neural networks can represent more complex features. So again, the nonlinearity allows us to do that. And also deep, deep neural networks, they generalize well when they are regularized properly. So when we design the model in a way that it predicts out of sample really well. Uh, on the unseen data. So rather than uh, memorizing the data, it actually learns how to capture the underlying patterns and relationships in the data. So that has been a lot of words, a lot of math, and I'm sure you're really starting to feel like there's so many questions in your head, like how do we choose the number of layers? How do we choose the number of hidden units? What about the activation function, et cetera? Um, we'll touch on those questions later in the talk. Just the general answer for now is that designing neural networks involves kind of both science and domain knowledge, understanding of the problem that you're trying to model, but also a little bit of art. Uh, so like everywhere, there are, rule of, there are rules of thumbs for certain things. But for now, let's just focus on their science part. And uh, we can first, we can learn how one will estimate such a model. Uh, so optimization. Uh, is one of the most crucial parts of designing a neural network. Um, optimization in our context here involves finding the parameters of a neural network that will reduce a cost function for uh, the one that we define, uh, which will typically be a square root loss, but obviously there, are, there could be others depending on the problem. So um, this, uh, this is a function of the network, of the parameters that will be, uh, this function will need to be minimized on the sample of test and training data and given the input features. So because we are dealing with uh, nonlinear functions, very complex functions, the cost function also becomes non-convex, which means that the traditional optimization methods like taking the derivative, setting it to zero, do not really apply. And instead we're gonna be using a more iterative approach which is called gradient descent, and it will allow us to solve numerically to find a local minimum. Um, since this error or cost function that we will define is nonlinear and complex, there will be multiple local minima that the algorithm will converge to. So there's a number of ways that people came up with uh, in modern applications, how to actually adjust the gradient descent algorithm to account for that, uh, to account for multiple local, local minima and speed up the training. So um, in general, the numerical solution to this uh, optimization problem can be summarized as iterative updates to the initial guess of the parameters. So here, WT is our initial guess of the parameters. Delta WT is what we update the parameters with. And obviously, WT plus one is the next set of the parameters. Um, the initial guess is typically chosen randomly and is standardized to have zero mean and variance for the convergence of the algorithm. Um, so the gradient or steepest, 
as we call it, steepest descent, is one of the most intuitive optimization algorithms. It starts with some initial guess of the weights, and at each iteration, it just moves a short distance in the um, direction of great, greatest rate of decrease of the error function. So this is a function of the parameters of the model, and we're trying to minimize that and find those parameters. Um, so yeah, so the updated value of the parameters is such that we are every step we're a little bit closer to the ones that will minimize the function. Uh, here, uh, there, w uh, the w delta w t equals to uh, you can see this term eta the Greek letter eta, which is a learning rate. So the gradient tells us the direction of the function change, and it's there. Uh, it is evaluated at every iteration, and the learning rate basically tells us how quickly, or we tell the optimization, how quickly the parameters are getting updated and is one of the hyperparameters that the researcher will have to decide on when setting up the model. Um, so yeah, simple gradient descent is evaluated on the entire sample of the data. And you can imagine that it's not very efficient, especially when we have uh, a lot of data. So what we do instead, instead we do um, stochastic gradient descent and mini batching. So stochastic gradient descent builds up on gradient descent and dramatically speeds up training. Instead of estimating the gradient on, on the entire sample, at each iteration, we estimate it only on one randomly selected point. So that is induces a lot of noise, but makes the conversion much faster. It also helps us with, uh, the, with escaping with, from local minima because we introduce the stochasticity. So we kind of go in along this noisy path, but on average, we converge to a minimum. You can imagine like you're asking somebody how to get from London to Edinburgh on the street and the person goes, us, go there. So you go there and then you ask the other person again, they point you to another direction. So you go along this like noisy path and eventually you'll, you'll get to Edinburgh. So that's the casting gradient descent. But evaluating on a, uh, like uh, on just one, um, uh, on just one point is obviously like way too noisy and unreliable. That's why we use mini batching. Um, in mini batching, uh, we split the sample and compute the uh, gradient descent on a small subset of the data. So we call it batch, uh, which is usually usually for a problem you'll have between 10 and 50 batches. So this is used in almost all modern applications. Um, and another thing here on the slide is um, called momentum. So momentum is another technique that tries to deal with the problem that uh, the gradient descent is noisy and uh, it allows uh, like kind of, it helps us avoid the situations when we're getting stuck in like flat areas of the uh, function that we're try trying to uh, optimize. So the, the parameters do not actually converge to the minimum, uh, but get stuck kind of like in this flat ravines. So the idea of the momentum is to update the weights using a combination of current and previous updates. So effectively like adding inertia to the parameter updates. It's pretty powerful, um, but another, it produces another parameter. So here it's called moon uh, for uh, the researcher to uh, optimize on. Finally, there is another trick that's called uh, gradient clipping. Um, and it also kind of is similar because we uh, generally want, want to avoid saddle points uh, of the functions when we're trying to optimize them. And it's, uh, so gradient clipping basically puts constraints on the steps of the gradient iteration. So we avoid kind of jumping into the saddle point. And the final words in the slides um, is about uh, one of the most difficult things is how to choose the learning rate of the stochastic gradient descent. Maybe we can have different learning rates for each parameter and update them somehow, you know, throughout the model training. So um, in model algorithms, all that is implemented. And there's a number here on the slide. There's Adagrad, Adam, and RMS prop. So this algorithm, they, uh, they have the adaptive learning rates. They have all their pros and cons. They're slightly different from each other. And the choice will depend on your particular problem. Um, OK, another buzzword. And I'm just going to sip a little bit of water. Um, backpropagation. So um, what is that? Um, backpropagation is basically gradient descent uh, in the context of neural networks. And uh, it's called this way because um, basically when we optimize the neural network model, there's two steps. There's forward propagation and the backward propagation. So in the first, back propag first forward propagation step, 
the input data is passed through the neural network to make predictions. So each neuron in the network will compute a weighted sum of its inputs, apply the activation function, all the jazz that we talked about when we we're talking about cellular neural perceptron. Um, so then this process continues through the layers of the network until the final output is produced. Then we compute our loss function. And after obtaining predictions from the forward propagation, we compute it, we measure the error between the predicted output and the actual uh, target values. So this loss function will quantify how far off the predictions are from the true values that we're trying to learn. Um, finally, the backward propagation. So the back propagation for short is the process when we calculate the gradient of the loss function with respect to uh, model parameters. So gradient will represent the direction and magnitude of the change that uh, is needed to minimize the loss. So it will tell us how by how much the parameters need to be adjusted to make the model's prediction more accurate. Um, so the calculation is performed using the chain rule of calculus, and it starts kind of from the output layer and works backward through the layers of the network. That's why it's called backpropagation. So for each layer, we'll compute the gradient um, on the parameters, and uh, we'll, uh, that will allow us to move to the next step to update the parameters, which is the gradient descent update. Uh, once we computed the gradients, we use them to update the parameters, etc. And the process of updating parameters is repeated iteratively for a special number of uh, epochs um, or until convergence, pretty much. So when the uh, loss function stops decreasing significantly. So then we repeat all that. We repeat steps one through four until, uh, like, for multiple epochs and until the model converges. And the term backpropagation basically comes from the fact that during the first backward propagation step, the gradients are calculated and propagated backward through the network, layer by layer, from the output layer to the input layer. So that will that allows us to update the parameters uh, of each neuron based on how much they cont contribute to the error um, in the final predictions. Uh, so these adjustments, they basically make improvements to the model's ability to make accurate predictions step by step. Oof, that was a lot of talking, uh, but let's move on. Um, output and hidden units. So typically output, uh, output units are either linear or for regression problems, uh, like they would be uh, linear or binary for classification problems. So there's really like not much to say about them and uh, hidden units are more interesting. So um, I've mentioned before that the fact that we're using the sigmoid function in the neural network is crucial because we need this linear non-linearity in order for the model to capture complex interdependencies. So we don't always have to use sigmoid function for that. In fact, rectified linear units and le leaky rectified linear units, you can see them here on the graph, uh, they are more popular in modern models. So um, Rectified linear units, um, they, um, the input directly, uh, the, the output the directly, uh, what we put into them, if it is positive and uh, zero otherwise, while uh, leaky reliefs, they allow for small gradients, uh, non-zero gradient for negative inputs uh, to mitigate like, the dying relief problem. So when everything is shrunk to zero. So those functions, you can see that they look kind of linear. So they retain some properties of linear models, which can help with uh, the problem of vanishing gradients. So when gradients become very, very small, and you know that leads to very slow and efficient, and efficient learning in the model. Um, so yeah, uh, those functions are generally preferred. Uh, prior uh, to them, as we, as we mentioned, sigmoid or hyperbolic tangent functions were uh, used. Now uh, they use less often because of uh, generally slow, uh, slow, slow learning vanishing gradients in deeper layers. Um, but some, ne some neural networks, some architectures still use them, for example, recurrent neural networks uh, or autoencoders they use uh, those activation functions uh, instead of release uh, because they're just more suitable for, like, for example, for when you model time series with RNNs. Um, a few words about model architecture. Um, when it comes to designing their neural network, determining the optimal number of hidden layers and units and all that is crucial uh, because it can significantly impact their network's performance. And this choice generally involves striking a balance between enabling the network to extract complex features and avoiding the 
having a very complex model and uh, avoiding overfitting, which will occur when the network becomes overly specialized on the training data and doesn't really uh, generalize well to new uh, unseen data. Uh, so in practice, increasing the number of hidden layers allows the neural network to capture uh, more complex uh, dependencies, represent hierarchical features in the data and deeper architectures. They can potentially uh, enhance the network's ability to recognize more intricate patterns. Um, there is no really rule of thumb that uh, you, one can apply. Generally, people start with them. Um, simpler architecture and gradually increase the complexity with more layers while watching the validation error. Uh, once it stops, uh, stops going down, then uh, you probably should stop adding the layers. Um, so with the number of hidden units, um, it is generally advisable uh, to have more hidden units than fewer. If in your network you have too few hidden units, then this network just might not possess the necessary flexibility to adequately describe the data. But obviously, there is the risk of overfitting. And to mitigate that while still benefiting from the large number of hidden units or layers, regularization techniques come into play. Um, Common methods are L1 or L2 regularization, um, where you will penalize large weights or activations and encourage the model to generalize better. So in practice, you can often see that the number of hidden units uh, within a reasonable range, like from five to 100, uh, and then a researcher will employ regularization techniques that will shrink the weights of irrelevant units towards the zero. So um, fine tuning regularization, there's always parameters when you try to use regularization methods. So you can you fine tune those parameters uh, with things like cross validation, for example. So um, in addition to architectural concentrations and regularization, there are other techniques that uh, you can use to enhance your network performance. One method that I'm sure you've heard of is called dropped out, drop out um, which involves randomly setting a fraction of uh, neural network uh, neurons uh, to zero uh, during each forward and backward pass of training. So that introduces kind of a bit of stochasticity in the model and encourages it to generalize better and be more robust. Um, Another thing that you could use is early stopping. So basically, you will stop training the model when the validation error uh, does not improve anymore. So there's many things. Um, that's the art part. And um, a few words. Uh, we have a few minutes left. So uh, a few words about advanced architectures uh, and how, how those are linked to what we were just talking about. We, just saw how a simple single layer perceptron works, how it generalizes to deep neural networks, how we optimize the model, and what are all of the design decisions that you'll have to be making when designing neural networks or all of the hyperparameters. So these concepts are also the foundation of modern complex models. So while this architecture is different, the mind map that we just laid out is uh, kind of similar. So obviously there is a whole ocean of their advanced models, um, but we're just going to name a few and try to link them to what we just talked about. Um, first one here on the slide is the convolutional neural network. Um, those are specialized deep neural networks designed for tasks like image classification, um, mainly image classification, but other things as well. And um, they use special types of layers called convolutional layers. Uh, so these layers, they allow automatically learn hierarchical features from the images. So basically convolutional layers are additional hidden layers in neural network. So again, linking it back to, uh, to a simpler model that, uh, that we went through. Recurrent neural networks, um, as I mentioned, that are used, they are used for sequential data processing where recurrent connections allow them to counter temporal dependencies in the data. So they're suitable for things like language processing or for example, time series predictions. Basically, we still have the input, the output layer, the hidden units, but we introduce recurrent connection between the neurons within, um, within the hidden layers. So those recurrent connections, they will create loops, allow them for information to uh, also be present and pass through different layers um, and within the same layer. So there are some considerations about training those models, uh, but generally it is the same idea as we've talked about. Um, 
And then, of course, we have our holy grail, the generative networks um, and the transformers. So generative networks encompass a wide range of models. Uh, they include the generative adversarial networks, the variational encoders, or representational learning, autogressive models, et cetera, et cetera. There's so much. And they used to generate data that will resemble a given distribution. So enabling things like image generation or text synthesis and analysis and all those things. Um, they also consist of a specific combination of deep neural nets, so specific kind of architectures. But basically, if you drill down on that, it's pretty similar to what we talked about. And finally, also the transformers, those are the foundational, highly complex models that used, as you know, for a wide range of natural language processing, like machine translation, text generation. I'm sure everybody talked to chat DPT already. Um, so the architectures are very complex, but even there in the graph here in the slide, you can trace out the familiar multiple layer perceptrons, for example, in the inputs when, when uh, we generate input embedded representations or in the uh, position wise switch forward networks inside the architecture. Um, all right, that's it for today. And I really hope uh, this talk was useful and would really help you dive deeper into the world of, wonderful world of AI. And um, if you want to learn more, here's a few resources that I linked. Uh, TensorFlow tutorials are amazing. And they're really great if you just want to have some hands-on experience with uh, coding the neural networks. Um, then there are other resources that uh, they are a little bit more uh, theoretical, but would really give you a very good understanding of like math behind um, behind neural networks and also how to design models, how to choose uh, you know number of hidden layers, units, all that jazz. Um, yeah, so feel free to dive in, and um, we'll have a few minutes uh, for Q and A. Um, happy to answer. I'll just open the chat real quick uh, to see if there's anything there. Q and A. Um, Emily, if you are on the call, do you want to ask this question? Yeah. Hey. So thank you so much for a great talk. Um, I did have a question that I recently learned about, which is uh, for graphical neural networks, and I was wondering how does gradient descent and backpropagation relate to graphical neural networks? Yeah, I'm actually not familiar with those architectures. So I'm probably not going to be able to answer this question, unfortunately. Could you share a bit more about how those neural networks look and what they do and the applications where they're used? Sure. Um, I just recently had an internship that uh, went into AI and uh, object detection, object classification, and tracking, um, and I worked with a student who studied more on the graphical neural network side, and I was interested in it. Um, mm -hmm. So ever since then, I've just been looking into the deep learning models, different kinds of models. And so um, yeah. researchers have developed neural networks that operate on graph data for mm -hmm. like over a decade, and we're starting to see practical applications in those areas, like antibacterial discovery, uh, physics, simulations, you know, recommendation systems of that sort. Yeah. And I'm still just learning about it, but um, I would imagine that gradient sure. descent and backpropagation would relate to it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as I said, I'm not familiar with that architecture, but uh, if I can just make up the answer, I'm sure it's uh, the intuition is similar is that you will have the outcome function that you're trying to approximate. So uh, once you estimate the model, you will compare what you estimated to the what you have in their test data, and you'll define the cost function based on that. And we'll try to find the parameters that will minimize the cost function that will make your prediction just closer to what you see in the data. So I would assume it is a similar approach. Uh, gradient descent is one of the most popular optimization algorithms for that. but probably, you know, like there's, there's other ways to do that as well. Sure. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, there's another question uh, from Amea. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, do you want to ask this? Yeah, that's, that's the right way to pronounce. So, uh, yeah, I know you're the ML uh, analyst at uh, Stripe. So I was just uh, 
so i'm a web developer uh, you know i'm actually just getting into this field uh, frankly i you know i don't have much uh, knowledge on you know uh, background knowledge on this but still uh, what tools do you use at uh, you know stripe with respect to your uh, current you know uh, work that you do there and uh, i understand there is enormous amount of data that is needed for uh, you know machine learning so how do you guys collect and store data and what tools do you use there yeah sure thank you for this question um you know uh stripe stripe is a big company so there's different divisions you know people there's engineers there's web developers etc there's also data scientists so we work with different data uh i specifically sit within operations so all the data that comes through support channels so for example the user uh decides to ask stripe a question about uh whatever the product that they use um so we gather that data and then we try to analyze that to uh make the product better so to make the user experience better um in terms of tools um we work with engineers who kind of set up the data warehousing infrastructure um and then we consume this data downstream so it's more in like offline data sources uh to analyze this data you know like work in python a lot um if you want to schedule some data jobs uh usually work with spark um or scala uh to kind of like create this uh, uh scheduled uh data tables um in terms of machine learning part, uh, generally, you know, scheduled Python tasks, uh, I think it's a pretty mm -hmm. standard approach. Um, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but uh, yeah, it's it's a pretty um, kind of standard stack, I'd say. Thank you. And just one more thing, uh, because I've been, uh, you know, uh, trying to research on this, and I recently, maybe a week or two ago, I was, uh, you know, experimenting with something called Llama uh, by Facebook. Mm -hmm. So I was trying my best to run it. It took 20 minutes to run, but it never run. Then I realized in the article, it said you need a GPU. You can't do it using a CPU. Mm -hmm. So yeah. That, but I'm as you can see, I don't have much knowledge. So my uh, question is, where do I get started? If I if I I, I I have a Mac M1, I don't it doesn't have a GPU, I guess. So how, should I use uh, you know the TensorFlow or uh, there is one uh, yeah. tool from PyTorch? What should I? Yeah. TensorFlow is a great resource, honestly. I can't recommend it enough, especially if you're just getting started. So all of their their like training materials are really good. And um, like when I've been learning that, uh, I've been using Google Collab a lot. It's also like super, super helpful. So you can spin up uh, a cluster pretty much. It depends if you want to pay more for that or not. But I think the free version is, is quite decent if you just like learning the tools. Um, I think it'll allow you to estimate like semi-complex models. I'm not sure about Llama uh, because it is like very, it, it is a heavy, heavy tool, uh, but something simpler. Um, you can work with uh, Google Collab. Great. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Sure. Um, okay. Uh, looks like we're at time. If there is no more questions, uh, is there one more? Raymond, uh, I think we have about like 30 seconds before the call ends, so fire away. Oh, I was just saying that I'm really consumed with AI. I spent the last six months learning everything that I can. I've learned so much. Um, I'm a full stack developer and have been for two decades and, you know, I've gone, I mean, I've picked up so much in the past six months and I don't know how to position myself to get, you know, involved with an AI company. You know, I'm, I'm interested in um, mm -hmm. explainable AI and ethical AI and, and I don't know what that day would look like. You know, I mean, before my day was building applications with React and Vue and all of that stuff. And, Mm -hmm. I don't know how to get in. You know, I feel like I'm late. Like I know people have been doing ML for 15, 20 years already, you know, so yeah. how do I transition? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think a good start is to is data science position, positions that specialized in machine learning. So maybe before moving in, into like machine learning engineer. So that sounds like something that you would be more interested in, but you could start with something that would be just maybe a little bit easier to get in. 
um, I would suggest that, like reach out to people on LinkedIn, like get references. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. also feel free to reach out. I'd be happy to be using it. Sure. Okay, thanks. Sure. Well, thank you so much for attending. It was lovely. Um, have a great day. Bye.